Okay, good evening um, from London or, um, well, morning, afternoon, whatever time it is where you are. Uh, welcome to our next in the series of our webinars, um, which is on biodynamic agriculture. Um, my name is Julia Lambeth. I'm one of the educators at WCT School London. Um, so WCT School London is one of the um, uh, course providers for the WCT qualifications um, and we hold courses normally in our building at London Bridge. Um, however, that's obviously not possible currently due to lockdown, so we've been uh, working more on our online events instead. Um, and I'm pleased to be able to share this uh, presentation on biodynamic agriculture with you this evening. Um, so I feel like I should put in a bit of a disclaimer to start with. Um, I am not a grape grower. Um, I, I don't work in a vineyard. I've um, been in vineyards. I've done kind of days of work here and there. Um, but I am really just a, a fan of wine. I'm an educator, obviously. Um, and I'm interested in biodynamic agriculture. So I started looking into biodynamics when I started studying for my diploma. Ten, over 10 years ago now um, and it's something that I have followed ever since and tried to kind of find out more where I can and that's sort of what led me to this presentation today. Um, what it means is that while you are welcome to ask questions as we go through using the um, Q&A function, um, I might not be able to answer all of them um, but I've Got a lot of information for you and I hope you find it interesting. Um, so let me just move on then to the plan. Um, oh, there, there we go, that's me. Um, so yes, I am Julia Lambert uh, and I completed my diploma a, a good few years ago now. So I get to use the term DIP WSET after my name. Uh, I know a few of you here are studying diploma uh, and that will be you soon. Uh, and there's a lovely picture of me in Alsace from a few years ago. Um, so back to the plan for the, today, um, we're going to start with some definitions. So obviously a definition of what biodynamic agriculture is, but also um, a few other terms that often get used around or sometimes even interchangeably with. Um, and I just want to clarify what biodynamics is, what it isn't, um, and a couple of other things that relate it. Uh, we'll have a look at the origins, uh, where it started. Um, the rules, we'll look through the preparations that are necessary for biodynamic agriculture, uh, the results meaning um, what happens in the vineyard and the wines uh, for producers that use these practices, uh, where we can find it, some of the challenges potentially, and the future question mark. Um, this is just a little idea really about um, where we are with biodynamics and what could happen uh, in the future with it. So we'll get onto that at the end. So first off, before we get into the definitions, um, I just wanted to take a little poll of everyone actually um, and see what your preferences are with regards to when you are buying um, wines yourselves. So hopefully you will see these options start to appear. It's an anonymous, an anonymous poll, um, so I won't be able to see who said what. Um, but just really for my own interest to see what you buy when you're looking at wine. So the options here, we've got organic, biodynamic, natural, sustainable, all of the above, none of the above, or not sure. Um, and I can see quite a few of you participating now. Thank you very much for that. So early indicators look like organic is important for quite a few people that's 29 percent there currently biodynamic slightly less so natural even less so than 14 percent sustainable even more up to sort of 34 35 percent uh 22 percent of people saying all of them 17 saying none of them and six saying not sure so that's a real mixed bag there um and i th think it would probably be uh, not necessarily representative of the uh, whole population because you guys being here now are obviously here because you're interested in wine 
I think if we were to look at the population as a whole, the numbers would be much smaller. Um, but even for you guys <laughs> here to listen to uh, the biodynamics, um, not everyone, it seems, thinks it's necessarily that important when buying wine, which is an interesting one. Well, thank you for participating in that. Um, we'll continue now then with some definitions then. So all those terms that I included in the poll, I'm just going to talk through. So you may not have been clear on what all those were in the first place, which will have made it harder to decide. Um, but there's a couple of other ones I thought I'd add in as well that you may come across uh, when you're reading about wines. So we've got conventional agriculture um, just to start with. So conventional agriculture is really what we mean by um, what's become commonplace in the 20th century. So agriculture where um, uses of um, chemicals in the vineyard or winery has become commonplace, fertilizers, use of machinery again in the vineyard and winery. Um, it's sort of maybe the more industrial side of agriculture. Um, and when I say agriculture, I mean viticulture. I'm going to kind of use the terms interchangeably for the purpose of today because it's obviously based on wine. Um, but they are terms that you can find across other um, farming practices as well. Now, what's interesting about what we refer to as conventional agriculture is obviously um, that's not really how it would have started, is it? When you think about wine being made hundreds or even thousands of years ago, none of this would have existed. So what's conventional to us today um, wouldn't necessarily have been so back then, but this is how it's developed over the recent century and a bit. Um, the reason we have these things are firstly because they allow us to control some of the problems we can get. Things like um, mildew in the vineyards can be a big problem. So some of these chemicals have been created to help prevent that. But then you've got other things to control pests, um, uh, herbicides to control weeds, all sorts of things that are going on. Um, and the other thing that a lot of these things will do if we're not in the vineyard is to help make the wine to a desired style. So that's a more commercial aspect that's also going to be have come around as a more kind of recent uh, invention. So that is what is currently considered conventional. So these other terms are all moving away from that to various degrees. So with sustainable, we're looking at practices that are going to protect the land, protect the vineyard for future use in future generations. So this could include things like reducing chemical use, um, managing pests in ways that are more uh, sympathetic with the environment, um, growing cover crops. So you've got other plants in your vineyard rather than just a, the monoculture, which is probably what you've seen in a lot of vineyards if you've been to them. Um, managing things like water use, all of these things are going to be tied in together. Um, but it does mean that some things are still permitted in terms of additions uh, in the vineyard. It's not a you can't do anything sort of practice. Same with the lute raisonne. So this um, translates as reasoned struggle. So it means that you can use chemicals if you need to. So rather than getting into the habitual uh, process of this time of year we use this spray and this time of year we use this spray, you only do things as and when or if they are necessary, if they're needed. Um, it's not a, a legally defined term, but it might be one that you come across. Organic is a term that um, can be defined. We've got um, organic certifying bodies around the world, which will tell you what you can and can't do in order to be considered organic. So with organic production, we're talking about removing synthetic chemicals from production in the vineyard and in the winery. This doesn't mean that nothing is used. Um, some um, additions, things like um, Bordeaux mixture, uh, which is copper sulfate is commonly still used, albeit to a lesser degree than what's permitted in conventional agriculture. Uh, but generally we're looking at, as I say, no chemicals, so healthier vineyards focus on the soil and making a product, making a, a, an environment that's altogether more healthy. Um, as I said, there are slightly different um, 
certifying bodies around the world, so there are different rules in different places. You would also find there's a difference between wine made using organically grown grapes and organic wine. So there's some differences in the labeling as well. Um, but all in all, it's that's what we're looking at. Um, and I think organic especially is a term that many of us are more familiar with. You may buy food that's organic already. You may think about other products in your life that are organic. So it's something that when applied to wine, you sort of have an intuitive understanding of it. This may be less true for biodynamic. And um, so this is obviously the focus um, of the topic today, and I'm going to expand on it in more detail shortly. Um, but just as an overview, uh, biodynamic agriculture is based on the philosophies of Rudolf Steiner, um, who was an Austrian philosopher. Um, and what we're looking at here is taking the principles of organic as a basic. Um, biodynamics is often seen as building on organic, so it actually predates a lot of the uh, rules around organic agriculture. Um, but it does still take those same uh, basic principles of no chemicals, focusing on the vineyard health, the soil. Um, but here, in order to facilitate that, what we're looking at is quite specific rules and specific things that you have to do. So this includes a number of preparations, as they're referred to, that you have to do in the vineyard. I'll talk about those shortly, uh, what they all are. Um, it also means things like paying attention to the lunar cycle, um, planting, harvesting, doing your various activities in the vineyard in conjunction with the lunar cycle, because it's acknowledged that the moon has a, a strong influence over the earth. Um, and I guess expanding on that, it's a philosophy that recognises that you're not just looking at plants in a vineyard, you're looking at the vineyard as an organism, as a thing that lives and breathes, essentially. And it's not just a set of different plants, it's one thing altogether, and you want to look after it as a single organism. But also that this organism is part of not just the wider area that is planted in, but part of the planet, which is affected by the not only the moon, but the rest of the solar system and the various forces that exist out there. So it's essentially trying to think about how all of these things interact and make sure that you're getting the best possible outcome for the health of the vineyard as a result of it. So some quite big ideas going on there. Um, and as I say, we'll expand on those shortly. Um, minimal intervention and natural were the other two terms here. Um, I think they pretty much mean the same thing, which is just you don't really do much. Um, not much added and not much taken away is the sort of simple way to explain it. So both in the vineyard and in the winery, you're aiming to do as little as possible to the vines, to the wine. Um, and so the product at the end of it should be, um, well, as, uh, as, li as little interfered with as possible. Um, so the term natural, in fact, both of them are not legally defined. The term natural seems to have become much more popular over recent years, um, but it is one of those that seems to have slightly different meanings for different people and different producers, and there isn't a sort of single style of natural wines that you could describe. Um, but that is potentially a whole other conversation. Um, so I'll leave that there for today. So hopefully that clarifies where biodynamic viticulture sits within this array of terms. And from here, what we're going to do is just focus on more specifics about biodynamic agriculture. Um, so starting at the beginning, so Rudolf Steiner, I mentioned earlier, is the Australian, uh, Australian, Austrian, uh, a philosopher who is, basically came up with the concept of biodynamics. Um, so he was it wasn't just biodynamic um, agriculture that he came up with. Um, prior to that, he had been um, famous for a, a spiritual philosophy known as anthroposophy. And this is basically looking at the sort of physical world combined with a spiritual world 
and trying to come up with a philosophy that encourages everything to work together. Um, depending on what you read about this guy, he is uh, referred to as an occultist, um, a word that doesn't necessarily have good connotations when we're thinking about um, the modern day. Uh, I also read he's apparently was thought of as a clairvoyant. Don't know about that either. Um, but needless to say, when you start doing a lot of reading about this, there's kind of various opinions of him. Um, so it's an interesting one. How much you will believe is going to be down to you. Um, a lot of people will take on board all parts of this philosophy. All of it is really important. And some people seem to be more interested in some bits than other bits. And we'll see that as we go along. Um, so from this um, collection, this philosophy that Rudolf Steiner created, it was um, only in 1924, actually, towards the end of his life, that he um, held his series of agricultural lectures. Um, this was eight lectures, and um, this was really where the procedure, the philosophy of biodynamics was first announced to the world. Uh, it was a very small affair at the time, as you can see, 111 people attended, um, but this was the starting point, and from there, uh, it did continue to grow. There was, you know, admittedly, maybe not a wholehearted response at first. Um, you can imagine people were quite cynical about some of the things that he proposes, as I've mentioned already, some of those ideas about cosmic and the spiritual element. Um, but he really believed the rules relating to agriculture were important. He'd started to see how chemicals were being used um, in farms around the world, not just in vineyards, and sort of predicted that this was going to become a serious problem. So that's kind of what led him towards this theory of biodynamics. Um, and to be fair, in that respect, he wasn't too far off. Um, so we start with this relatively small audience, uh, but it does grow. So uh, over time, uh, different people become involved. We can see in 1938, Erin uh, Fried Pfeiffer's text on biodynamic farming and gardening was published. Um, this was published in five different languages and would actually go on to become the sort of leading text in biodynamics for about um, five decades. So it's quite an important one. Um, after that, we just see continued growth. Um, I think by the 1930s, you had a sort of about a thousand farms around the world were already um, practicing biodynamic principles. So you can see how it, again, started small but continued to grow. Uh, by the time we get to 1963, uh, you can see we have the first issue of Mariaton's biodynamic calendar. This will come back to you uh, a bit later as well. Um, but as I've mentioned already, the lunar cycle being important to biodynamic agriculture means that there are certain times of um, times of the year, but also certain days that are better doing some activities rather than others. Uh, and this is really a reference for people to know which days are good according to uh, the philosophies of the biodynamic principles and which are not. And that's continued to be published um, every year since then. You can buy the 2021 version now if you wish. Um, so again, continuing to grow. Um, interestingly, it's still not massive in wine up until this point. So it was only in the 1980s, really, that we start to see the principles of biodynamic agriculture being applied to vineyards. Um, started off in France mainly, um, but did grow from there. And now, obviously, it's an international um, phenomenon. So we jump forward a bit um, to 1997, Demeter International Forms. So Demeter is the certifying body for um, biodynamic. Um, farms. Up until this point, you had kind of lots of separate um, kind of certifying bodies in lots of different countries, and they didn't really all link up together. So it's at this point that you have this kind of global overview. Um, the term Demeter had been used with reference to biodynamics before that, but it's at this point that it becomes used for this um, international organisation. And as we continue on, um, 
I have a little date in the middle just to mention is in 2008, um, we actually have some biodynamic rules applied to wine making as well as grape growing. So when we think back to Steiner's original agriculture le lectures, they were very much based on the vineyard, on the farming, uh, the physical part of it in the farm. Um, the winemaking, however, is also going to be important, right? You can't just do all of this work in the vineyard and then make the wines in the same way that they're doing for the conventional wines. That's not going to work. So this imposed rules on um, additives that you can use, processes that you can use in order to show that the winemaking process was consistent with the vineyard process. Um, and then finally, we get to last year um, where you can see the Mita International and the International Biodynamic Association joined forces. Um, so this is basically the new international umbrella organization for all um, biodynamic and Demeter associations worldwide. So um, this is now known as the Biodynamic Federation Demeter International. Yeah, so um, as you can see, over this time and still continuing to grow in the number of um, vineyards that are practicing these principles and continuing to grow in terms of the organizational structure. Um, so yeah, well, a lot's happened in that time. Now we know where we started. Uh, let's just have a little bit more of a look at the rules associated with biodynamic production. So I've mentioned already that synthetic chemicals are not permitted. Uh, organic viticulture is the kind of bare minimum that you would have to practice. And then you do your biodynamic preparations on top. So there are a number of preparations that are required for you to do in the vineyard in order to become um, certified as biodynamic. And you can see those indicated on the screen there. Um, so 500 and 501 are the horn preparations. Um, and these are applied more to the vineyard. Um, from 502 down to 507, 508. Um, these are used for compost, but there's a slight difference between them. Um, a shout out here goes to my colleague Lydia, who um, allowed me to use her photos for this. Um, so it gives you a bit of an, under, an illustration of what we're looking at here. So to talk about these in more detail. So 500, the horn manure, um, well, includes the horn. You can see the pictures of the horns there. Um, and what you would need to do for this is you fill the, cow, the cow's horn with manure. Um, you would bury it in the soil in your vineyard over winter. When you dig it up, you mix it with water and then you spray this uh, onto your soil. Um, the mixing it with water is an important part. Um, you have to mix it for an hour and you have to stir it in both directions. Uh, this is known as uh, dynamizing, dynamization of the mixture, um, basically bringing it to life to then be um, used or, or to then be put into the vineyard. So it's a very specific process. The horn silica um, is similar. Uh, so again, we've got the cow's horn, but this time instead of putting manure in, we're putting silica, we're putting um, essentially ground quartz in instead. Uh, this time it's buried over summer um, for the silica, uh, but then again, the same thing, it's mixed with water, the, the mixture is dynamized, and then this time this is sprayed onto the vines instead. The others, as I mentioned, are for compost. Um, and these, as you can see, involve various different ingredients and there are a number of different things that you have to do. So 502, the yarrow preparation is yarrow fermented in stag's bladder. Uh, 503, the chamomile preparation is chamomile encased in uh, cow's intestine and buried over winter. Sea nettle preparation is uh, basically tea. Oak bark preparation is fermented in the skull of a domestic animal. The dandelion preparation, 
uh, is dandelions fermented in um, basically cow intestines. And then the valerian preparation is uh, the juice from valerian plants. Um, I put 508 in brackets there, and that's because some of the resources I've looked at include it and some don't. Um, so this seems to be, of all of them, the one that's maybe not used for every vineyard. Um, but horsetail is a herb um, and it's uh, just using the tea from the horsetail plant. So that's all of those. Um, the interesting things here, well, there's a lot of interesting things here really, aren't they? It's um, quite a list of activities that you would need, you'd be expected to complete in order to be um, certified as a biodynamic vineyard. Um, each of them has different functions. The various animal parts that I mentioned um, are important because it said that the function that the animal part carried out when the animal was alive is then related to what it does for this preparation um, when it's used here. Um, the herbs all have, um, herbs or plants all have particular um, properties to them, uh, various restorative properties uh, that are supposed to obviously help with the um, compost, which is going to help with the life of the vines. Um, all in all, what we're looking at, I guess, to boil it down, are ways to try and encourage biodiversity within the vineyard. Um, and one of the things we'll come to shortly when we're looking at biodynamic vineyards is that the soil is much more diverse, much more alive compared to vineyards which have undergone conventional agriculture. So it definitely does make a difference. Um, how much of a difference would it make if it wasn't in a hall? I don't know. Like, there's quite a few things that are that we could question here. It's not going to be my role this evening to say whether I think, you know, it's all 100% has to be done this way or whether there are some things which maybe could be taken away and it would still work in the same way. I don't know that. Um, but I think, well, hopefully you will agree. It's just all quite interesting. Um, so those are the preparations. Um, other things that are important for biodynamics, as I've mentioned already, are the lunar calendar. So this goes back to um, Maria Tun's book, uh, where we've got the, um, the importance of the lunar calendar is reflected in um, which activities you should do throughout the month and throughout the year. So some days will be better for planting seeds, some days are better for fruit production, some days are better for working on the um, um, training of the vine, things like that. Um, this has been taken to further degrees in some places. I remember a few years ago, it was said that some of the um, major wine retailers were planning their press tastings in conjunction with the biodynamic calendar so that you would only uh, they would only hold their press tastings on a fruit day because the fruit day was uh, supposedly when the wine would taste best. Um, I did look that up recently and I couldn't find any evidence for it so I don't know if that's 100% true but uh, that's what was being said. Um, there seems to be some doubt as to whether being a fruit day does actually mean your wine tastes better. Um, but you may be happy to know if you are drinking any wine that it is a fruit day today. So would your wine taste better today than it did yesterday? I don't know. Again, you can decide that. Um, so there we have it. Lots of quite particular rules to follow. Um, I think an interesting point on the lunar cycle, um, again, it's one of those things, especially when we're talking about the connection with the zodiac, which is often referenced in the kind of um, guidelines to biodynamic production, might be a bit cynical about. But when you think about the influence of the moon more generally, think about how we have <clears throat> tidal forces, think about how much of a plant is actually made from water. You know, there are 
some ways in which it's not kind of totally outlandish that the moon has an influence and it, it in some ways it makes a lot of sense actually um so you can see how some of these connections start to be made um so if you do all of your preparations you follow all of the other rules then um you can apply to be certified by Demeter, the body that we've talked about already um of course this is going to come at a cost and they will obviously want to um maintain checks here on you to ensure that you are doing everything that should be done which is also going to be another pressure on the vineyard so not everyone that practices these principles is certified so that means that not every bottle of wine which has been made using biodynamic principles actually says they're anywhere on the bottle sometimes you just have to know the producer and know what they do to understand whether they do or don't um, but that's a separate issue so from here i just wanted to talk about what can we expect from a wine um, that's been produced using biodynamic, biodynamic principles um, and there's a few points here um, just to give us a place to start really uh, the first one which is really the easy one is better vineyard health um, by removing chemicals as a start you're already going to be making sure that your vineyard is more alive compared to a vineyard that is repeatedly sprayed with chemicals year on year um, i've got a couple of sort of quotes here from various books um, i should say by the way i've got a list of resources at the end for um, everything that i've looked at in order to prepare for this session so you can have a full list of those later um, so first off in uh, the oxford companion to wine uh, you, there was um, re results from uh, Claude Bourguignon to show that he found greater levels of microbial life in vineyard topsoils and in roots down to several metres deep in biodynamic vineyards, not just compared to conventional vineyards, but also compared to organic vineyards as well. So there is a difference between um, organic and biodynamic, you know, I guess what I'm saying is there is a difference that these preparations make. Um, another example was in Wine Science, Jamie Good's book, um, where we see again better soil quality um, and lower yields, which is often associated with more concentrated um, fruit flavours in wine. So again, thinking about how it's going to be beneficial to the production of the wine. Better for the environment is another consideration, uh, of course, because we're using less chemicals. Uh, we're also using less machinery generally. So you're not going to see the same tractors um, running through the vineyards as you will see in um, a conventional situation. Even in the winery, we're more sympathetic. So you're not going to see so many big um, kind of pneumatic presses or things like that necessarily. Uh, it's going to be more gentle processes uh, in order to get the most out of the wine. So where we are using less machinery, that's obviously going to have less of a carbon footprint. Animals are often encouraged um, within these vineyards, um, partly just because of this idea of the vineyard as a living thing. Not only are we going to have other plants in there, but we're also going to have animals which are going to add to the um, biodiversity again, the microbiodiversity by the manure or saliva that they, that they impart to the vineyards. So a lot of different things going on together. Um, better for people, question mark. Um, it's dangerous territory, I guess, to talk about wine being healthier in any way, because, um, you know, still wine. Um, but a comment in um, Isabel Leisure on NW's book, Natural Wine, uh, I found quite interesting was that the levels of pesticide uh, found in wine that are, are legally permitted in wine would not be permitted in drinking water in the UK. Um, and given that wine is mostly water, um, it's another thing that is a bit concerning. So when we're looking at these wines which aren't made with pesticides and these other chemicals they naturally are going to have 
lower levels so they shouldn't have the same that we're going to find in conventional agriculture um, and while um, one of the other things that is going to be reduced in biodynamic uh, wines compared to conventional wines is the level of sulfites as well. So sulfites are permitted, uh, they're not abolished completely, but you are allowed much less than what you would find in a bottle of conventional wine. Um, and I don't know if you've spent much time reading about sulfites, you'll know there's quite a big debate there as well. Um, but the sort of general argument boils down to the more other things you have in your wine that are not the wine, the more it's going to be maybe doing things that aren't so good for you. So of course there are people that are allergic to sulfites and it's definitely not good for them. But even for the rest of us, um, if you think about the additives that are in wine, sulfites and potentially other things included to be fair, um, the more of other things that are in your wine that you don't know about, the less good potentially it's going to be for you. Um, and just as a side note, really, I don't know if you've ever considered ingredients in wine. Um, we always think of wine as being this natural product, but as I've mentioned already, conventional agriculture has moved very far away from that. And there are lots of things you can do in the vineyard, lots of things you can add in the winery to change and manipulate your wine to make it the way you want it. But none of these things are ever indicated on the label. Mm wouldn't be the same for any other products really is there any food that you buy any other drinks that you consume you know what's in there so it's an interesting thing to consider I'll leave you to uh, decide what you think about that otherwise I'm going to go off on a big tangent and that's just not necessary right now um the final point I put here for uh, the results is good tasting wines um so when I was preparing for this session, I was like, okay, I need to think about whether bi wines produced using biodynamic uh, principles are better than conventional wines. So obviously my first um, action was to Google, does biodynamic wine taste better? Um, and my top three results said yes, no, and maybe, um, which I think tells you about as much as you need to know. Um, for the conclusive um, result of um, whether or not biodynamic wines taste better. Um, it's not conclusive, people can't agree. Uh, however, it's not done necessarily to make people agree, it's done because of the principles when it comes down to the vineyard and producing wine in a way that is all of the things we've said already. Um, it just amused me, however, that you can get such a, a array of different results. Um, I did put up there um, a um, research paper that was the yes, one of the yeses. Um, this was quoted in on the website Vine Pair, um, a paper by Professor Dalmas on uh, which was titled "Does Organic Wine Taste Better?" An analysis of experts' rate, ratings, and they basically looked at um, wine ratings from experts across a number of publications a number of wines, a number of years. And they took all this evidence, which apparently they had to do um, by hand because the publications didn't want to give it to them. Uh, they looked at all the scores for all the wines and then went and looked at all the wines and uh, worked out whether they were organic, biodynamic, conventional, whatever they might be. And then analyzed the scores versus the process used to make the wine to see if there would be any overall difference. And what they found was that there was um, overall, the um, experts ratings were um, higher, statistically significantly higher for bi biodynamic wines compared to other wines. Um, and they believed in the validity of this because most of the tasting notes for these wines from these publications was done blind. That said, as I, as I say, um, other studies, other results have shown uh, other things. So. That's just one perspective. Again, it will be something you can look into uh, different studies and different um, procedures have found different things. Okay. All right, a few, um, well, just a list of locations here for you really. Um, so having talked about where biodynamic agriculture started with Rudolf Steiner in Austria, 
uh, it very much was a sort of Eurocentric sort of thing for a while. France was one of the countries to really go for it. But as you can see now, there are biodynamic vineyards in countries all around the world. So this um, list of countries was taken from Demeter's uh, wine growers list, which you can just download for free from their website. And it actually has um, for each country, all of the um, vineyards that are certified biodynamic. Um, for the big countries with uh, the greater um, number of vineyards, uh, it's divided into regions. So you can have a look through there and um, see what's going on in your country or see what's going on in your favorite region um, and start to come across these biodynamic certified producers if you are interested. Um, oh yeah, a little, little stat there. It's not been particularly easy to find up-to-date statistics for the proportion of um, biodynamic production of vineyards in the world. Um, but that one was from 2017, 4.5% of the world's wine grape vineyards were certified biodynamic or organic. Um, I mean, one of the challenges frequently when looking at studies related to biodynamic wines is that they're normally biodynamic or, or organic. It's all kind of grouped in together. So it's quite hard to tell what's relevant just to biodynamic rather than one or the other. Um, but it's a good place to start. Uh, quite a small percentage, you'll notice there. I think particularly for those of us in the wine trade, when once you do start hearing about these wines, you just start, it just seems like they're everywhere. Everyone's practicing biodynamic now. Um, but really, it, it's not, it's really still quite a small um, percentage of production. Uh, and of those, about 80% were in Europe. So still quite dominant in terms of European production. But as I say, uh, it's been growing for a long time and will continue to do so. Okay. Challenges. So we've come this far. And you may be thinking, well, this all just sounds like a load of nonsense. I don't know why anyone would do it. Or you may be thinking, this is such a great idea. Why didn't they know more about it? I can totally see how this all fits together and this cosmic energies and the lunar cycle totally makes sense to me. You know, people are gonna go either way. Um, either way, the biodynamic industry, biodynamic wines as a whole, do have some challenges. For people that like them, they like them and they're gonna buy them, they're gonna keep buying them. For other people, it's a little bit more tricky. Um, so one of the big challenges is consumer understanding. So um, the paper that you can see there, an overview of the biodynamic wine sector, um, brought together a number of different studies which have been done on biodynamic wines specifically. Um, and they cite here that they're trying to find specifically biodynamic wines rather than biodynamic and organic clumps together. But as I've mentioned already, uh, it's not necessarily that easy to separate them. Um, and they found a few different things. Confusion among consumers. Um, people don't understand the term biodynamic. They're not familiar with it. Um, some people even think it has negative connotations. Um, thinking about sort of bioengineering or genetically modified, things like that. So they actually think biodynamic sounds bad, they're less likely to buy it. Um, misunderstanding, I mentioned already, there's quite a few different labeling terms that can sometimes get mixed up together that people don't necessarily know what's what. Um, they're not willing to pay more. Uh, I've said already that well, cost, as you can see, is the next point. It, it is going to cost more to make these wines um, because you have more uh, labor, obviously, due to the preparations in the vineyards. Um, you can't use the mechanization that other vineyards may do. So it's going to take more time to do these things. Um, but yeah, the, the consumer opinion is generally, well, given that most people don't understand it, why would they pay more of it for it? So it is a bit tricky. Um, and it, uh, one of the interesting things that they found actually was the target market for these wines is normally going to be um, just normal consumers. Because if you're looking at people that are kind of really into 
kind of organic and health substances and things like that, they're normally the people that aren't going to drink much alcohol because alcohol is considered to be not necessarily healthy for you. So it is a kind of tricky line that they're going to straddle. They're creating a product that's ostensibly produced in methods that are better for the wine, better, as I said, potentially for people. Um, but, you know, who's going to know? So a little bit of work to do there in terms of consumer understanding. Um, cost, yeah, I've said it's, it's going to generally be more, be more expensive. Uh, depending on who you talk to, um, some estimates reckon it's ab about 50% more expensive to make a biodynamic wine compared to just um, a wine produced by conventional agriculture. So if you can't charge more for your wine, if people aren't willing to pay more, it is eventually going to make it unsustainable. Um, that said, I think most biodynamic producers have enough of a um, small but committed community of buyers that they don't really have to worry too much. Um, but it will be interesting as this continues to grow to see whether the wider population will eventually kind of get on board with it as it were. Um, certification is another challenge, uh, mainly because it's expensive again. Uh, and you do have to jump through the various hoops, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and you will be expected to kind of prove that you are doing all of the preparations and all of the things that are required in order to maintain your certification. Um, general cynicism was the last point. Um, I think even among the wine trade, uh, once you understand the preparations, as I said earlier, you either believe it or you probably don't. Um, Non-believers sometimes just um, dismiss it. Uh, it's too much of the spiritual. It's not scientific enough. Um, there was even a comment in um, Jamie Good's book in Wine Science saying that people want to do more research on this to sort of understand exactly what the impacts are. But if you submit a topic for a paper uh, as a request for funding and it's got the word biodynamic in it, it will get turned down because people just don't have a belief in it at the, at the moment that it's going to be worth it. So, yeah, it's a challenge. And you've got to kind of be impressed with, especially some of the um, early people that converted and think about just what they would have had to experience from, you know, their neighbouring vignerons or people nearby who would be like, why are you doing that? Why aren't you just spraying? What's all that, all those cow's horns for? You know, it's, um, it is different and it's gonna have taken people a long time to get where they are. Uh, and still, as I say, there's not wholesale everyone on board. Um, but there we go, people who do it, do it because they believe in it. Okay, so, Coming towards the end now, um, I just wanted to mention what I've referred to as an alternative perspective. Um, so we've talked about the preparations of the soil and kind of the studies earlier where we saw that um, the level of microbes in the soil uh, is definitely higher in biodynamic um, soils. So there definitely is a difference there. Um, it's not just microbial life that's going to be important. Uh, you can see the lovely picture of the earthworm there. Um, earthworms are also important um, for maintaining soil health, uh, largely because they will tunnel through, they will leave space that um, air can get through, uh, and it's, it's, it's important that soils are aerated. This can all be undone if you are tilling your soil too much, if it's compacted by the use of tractors or machinery, things like that. So understanding how all these things work together is important. Um, uh, and apparently, fun fact for you, um, the weight of all the earthworms in the world um, would be the same as that of all the other animals combined. So there you go, there's a lot of earthworms, they're important, uh, which is why I put that little picture up there, just so we, re we remember that. Um, all right, and then the other 
thing that I really wanted to talk about here um, in terms of this alternative perspective um, is based on a, an article written by uh, Katia Nelsbaum in, on JanceRobinson.com a couple of years ago, which was titled Biodynamics, A New Approach Needed. So Katia um, owns a vineyard in Italy um, and basically had been thinking about how she works with the vineyard and how to improve it. Uh, and sort of come towards this idea of a modernized approach of biodynamics, um, largely after reading about uh, a book about that, um, well, called The Hidden Life of Trees by Peter Volumbin, which is about how trees and plants in general interact and communicate. There's much more going on than we can see. And this really got her sort of thinking about the interconnectedness of vines. It, you know, if it's happening for other plants in general, it's gonna be happening for vines too. Um, and she did a lot of research on this. Um, I highly recommend you read this, uh, this article, by the way, it is fascinating. Um, and sort of drilled down to the um, level of the uh, mycorrhizal fungal networks within the soil. So mycorrhizal fungi live in the soil, very tiny, tiny microscopic fungi. They live on the surface um, of the roots of the vines and basically have this symbiotic relationship. Um, so the fungi help the roots absorb water and nutrients from the soil. They'll in fact break down some of the nutrients which the roots can't necessarily access by themselves. So the fungi are helping the roots of the vines get the nutrients they need. And then the vines actually help sustain the fungi by providing carbohydrates uh, for them to live on. So part of the result of the photosynthesis of the vine will be distributed into the soil so that these fungi can access them uh, because the fungi themselves don't have the ability to photosynthesize. So these fungi are interconnected. It's a, a network. So across your vineyard, the fungi are connecting the vines together and everything else together. And this was the perspective of a living soil, I guess, which really appealed to Katia here um, and helped to explain how this idea of living soil, this idea of living vineyard can actually start to be explained by a greater understanding of science. So while Rudolf Steiner's intuitive um, lectures were important and, you know, again, he wanted, he thought of the vineyard as a living organism um, and then created the explanation for this, including the lunar and cosmic forces. Her perspective is, it was a good start and definitely what he's doing is onto something there, but it may not be necessarily the way we have to approach things in the future. Um, the comparison she makes is with the theories of um, Sigmund Freud, psychoanalysis. Um, at the time, very important. And, you know, we still practice some things related to that now, but people aren't using exactly the same techniques as he was then. So we've taken the best bits and adapted it using the knowledge that we've gained in that time. And this is really the suggestion here. Do we need to do all of these things that are um, part of the biodynamic rules? Or can we understand what these are doing and then just make sure that we are promoting the best vineyard health, making these wines in the best way possible, but we can leave out some of the bits we don't want. Um, so quite controversial. Um, the question would really be, if you start leaving some bits out, is it gonna still be considered biodynamic? If you're not doing all of those things, is it something else instead? Is that better, is that not so good? Would it be any more useful to have another word for another practice um, in the vineyard for um, us all consumers uh, more generally to try and get to grips with? So yeah, 
it's just an interesting idea. Um, whether you think it would be good or not, I will leave up to you to decide. Um, but it does mean that the future may not continue exactly as it has done. But I mean, that's the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be. Uh, and the good news is we should still get good wine as a result of it. So that was really where I wanted to finish, leave you with a nice big question that you can mull over and see what you think. Here is um, a list of the resources that I've referred to. It should be all of them. Um, there are obviously lots of different pages that you can look at, um, but I found these useful as a starting point. Um, now it's time for some questions. So if you haven't uh, put your question in there so far, please do so. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I may not be able to answer all of them, um, but I will do what I can. So Natalia has asked, do you believe that the future of winemaking is 100% organic and biodynamic? Um, I guess my answer is I would like it to be, but in reality, I don't think it will be. When we think about wines that are, are produced on a commercial scale, um, it's just not going to be possible. So in order for wines for production to move to being 100% organic and biodynamic, there really needs to be a change in consumer consumption first we'd need people to want to buy these wines and then really to pay more for these wines in order for the production to follow so we'll see oh gabrielle has asked where would you put vegan wines any specific agriculture style? Um, that's a good question. I forgot to include vegan and vegetarian, didn't I? Um, so it's largely considered that uh, biodynamic wines are not vegan or vegetarian due to the um, aforementioned animal parts. Um, other than that, it would be a choice for um, natural, no, natural producers and normally vegan. Um, organic producers is a choice. Um, in conventional wines, yeah, it could be anything. So, in conclusion, biodynamic, no. Natural, yes, others, maybe. Uh, studies asked, do organic and natural wines contain sulfites? Um, so I think I touched on that a little bit, um, but just to expand, yes. For the most part, um, although the amounts permitted are much smaller compared to conventional wines. Um, so natural wines, even less than organic or biodynamic wines, some natural producers will try not to add any sulfites. Uh, another labeling term that I didn't include is sulfite free or no added sulfites. So you can choose not to add any, but most will add or a lot will add at least a little bit, um, partly to help preserve the wine, but also it's kind of just a bit of security measure. And apparently some countries won't sell wines if they don't have sulfites in them. They don't believe that they're gonna have the um, ability to last if they don't have some uh, addition to them. So yeah, but you can definitely find wines without added sulfites. Um, and just to be clear, there are tiny, tiny amounts of sulfites created by the winemaking process. So you'll always have at least a tiny, tiny bit, but it's the amount that's added, which varies quite considerably um, among different wines. Okay. 
Uh, Francesco has asked how WCT is approaching the natural wine teaching. I, I can't answer that. Um, I'm an educator, but I don't write the courses. Um, so whether or not that makes it onto the syllabus in future courses will remain to be seen. There's some technical questions. The proportion of cow dung and water, I don't know. It's quite small proportions. So you um, uh, think of it in terms of sort of homeopathic quantities. Um, so you'll have a lot of water and a small bit of um, cow manure, but I couldn't tell you exactly the proportion there. The people bringing up the vegetarian vegan point. I hope they've answered that. Oh, loads of you asking that. Okay. So someone's asked, um, what effect does a neighboring conventional plot? have on a biodynamic one or vice versa, uh, because pesticides spread. And uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's still possible to be certified biodynamic, um, even if your neighbor is using pesticides. Um, obviously, it might lead to a few disagreements, but um, that that's the way it goes. In some areas, you might find that there's been a sort of agreement that um, people kind of have altogether stopped using pesticides, but I don't think that's that common. That normally the influence of pesticides from neighboring vineyards isn't significant enough to cause problems. But um, yeah, I don't, don't say it's not impossible. Um, question about fermentation of biodynamic wines, wild yeasts only. Um, yeah, so the rules for biodynamic wine production, I don't know whether it's prohibit or just strongly recommend the use of um, wild yeasts only. Um, so you're not using inoculated yeasts from, um, you know, yeast shops which have that um, sweat I'm looking for. Consistency with wines around the world. So part of the advantage of not using your fungicides in the vineyards is that it's also going to mean you have a healthier population of wild yeasts because yeast are the fungus. So if you're using fungicides to kill your mildew or whatever, you're also going to have an influence on the wild yeast production. So these grapes should have a stronger wild yeast um, population to start with. Um, and that does mean greater complexity of different yeasts. So how you control the aromatics, you don't. You let the grapes express themselves. You let the yeast express what's in the grapes. And you're just there to you know, gently encourage them along. So the idea behind many of these wines isn't to manufacture them. It's to just help them into being. Um, in French, they don't use the term wine making like we do in English. They would say élevage, uh, you raise the wines. And I've always thought that's quite a nice concept. So you're not making them, you're not manipulating them or forcing them into something. You're just helping them um, express what's there already. So yeah, wild yeast is definitely a key to that. trying to find some different questions. Mm. 
in some locations lend themselves more to biodynamic winemaking, e.g. dry equals less disease. Yeah, it's definitely going to help, isn't it? Um, if you've got less disease pressure, um, it's going to mean that there is less of a need to try and, you know, cure the um, whatever problems you might have. However, you will find biodynamic vineyards in climates, uh, vineyards in vineyards with lots of different climates. Um, and really what the idea is, is that it's prevention rather than cure. So by having your healthier vineyard, your living soil, this organism of a vineyard, it means that it's not going to be vulnerable or susceptible to diseases that other vineyards may be. So even in places which might have more humid conditions or where other vineyards might be more susceptible to disease, your biodynamic vineyard should still have a, a level of natural protection created by the processes, by the things you've done in the vineyard in preparation, essentially. Again, just trying to look at some different questions because there's a bit of repetition. Okay, it looks like we're just kind of covering the same sort of things. Um, so, if uh, there, there was quite a lot of questions I didn't get to read, so if I haven't answered your question um, and you would like me to, please feel free to get in touch. Um, you can contact me on the school educators at wsctglobal.com email address um, for your queries regarding biodynamics or indeed anything else. Um, all that's left for me is to say thanks for coming, thank you for attending. Uh, I hope you found that interesting and useful. Uh, as I say, it's thrown up quite a few different questions that you can go and consider in your own time. Um, but yeah, as I say, I think it's interesting. Uh, I've had an interest in it for, for a while and it's, uh, it's nice to be able to share it with you all. Um, I'll just leave you here with the um, final slide with the social media tags. If, if any of you want to um, clearly post, that's how you contact us. Um, and I will say, yeah, thanks once again. Um, I'll end the recording here.